Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shido Yan. I'm uh, currently working in Sunnyvale campus, but actually I'm uh, from Fujitsu, Japan, working in a business group called Ubiquitous Business Group. It's a little bit difficult to understand, but pretty simple. We're making uh, all the computing devices from desktop, laptop, tablets, smartphone. And now, while I'm here, because the computing device becomes smaller and smaller, and then it comes up IoT wearable. So I'm um, so glad to be here with um, two panelists from uh, um, Pro Professor Chris Pfister from Berkeley, and also uh, Dr. Sawasaki-san from Fujitsu Lab, Japan. Um, so hopefully, in this next 15 minutes, uh, we can touch some very difficult topic about sensing and wearable IoT and what it really means, there's all different type of device there. So I think during this session, I really want to make a very open discussion with two panelists right here to just figure out what really those technologies mean to us for our private life and also uh, for enterprise business operation. So I'm gonna start with uh, two uh, 10 minutes presentation from uh, both uh, Dr. Sawasaki-san and Professor Pfister, just to get a start point about what those experts have been doing, how they looking into uh, this area. And from then, we will start kind of some open discussion. And during that discussion, I will welcome any uh, different opinions or suggestions or questions in the late part. So from there, I will just pass it to Sawasaki-san. You can start your, your presentation. Okay. Okay, my name is Naoyuki Sawasaki. Uh, I am working uh, in the Human Interaction Laboratory of human, cent oh, sorry. human Centric Computing Laboratories. Uh, today, I will talk about the wearable technologies for human empowerment. So uh, this slide shows our research activities, a whole activities in the laboratories to realize our human empowerment. For human empowerment, we, we are now developing technologies to enable empowering people and society by integrating, also, I, I push wrong button. So real and digital world. In order to realize human empowerment, we think uh, not only cloud computing technology, but also a front interface technology, engaging multiple senses and enabling natural operations uh, need to be uh, developed. So uh, our research theme is very, uh, for example, uh, multimedia processing for uh, multi-sense interfaces, uh, wearable computing, wearable assistant technologies for en enhanced diabetes, and smart communication platform for uh, connectivities. So today, uh, I will talk about wearable technologies. Uh, this is, uh, that is uh, the, uh, one of the themes of this panel discussion. So uh, this slide uh, shows uh, features of wearable devices we expected to enable front user interface to support various uh, field work uh, in the field. So there are, uh, mm, sorry. So uh, custom, continuous, and direct. So as you know, well, uh, wearable devices can be, uh, should be configured to, uh, to realize optimal user interface for various work scenarios, and uh, always running and ready to assist uh, people in real time. So, uh, and uh, the wearable devices also in enable to, should enable to link human behavior to information, information in the crowd. That, this means uh, by using wearable devices, it is possible to get uh, information about the working context. And uh, it is possible to uh, provide uh, services immediately, depending on the working context. 
such a feature are very important to wear uh, technology, we think. So. <laughs> okay. So by, so by using uh, wearable, tech, wearable devices for front, front end uh, interface, uh, it is possible to provide our back, sorry, our back, it's, our back end services to, to, to provide uh, in a timely fashion to support workers in the field, various fields, uh, to support uh, subsequent tasks. So, and uh, it's also possible to realize uh, some kind of uh, new services based on the gathered uh, working context in the various working fields to optimize, for example, to optimize uh, work process uh, and so on. So, so next uh, I'd like to uh, show our recent activity on wearable devices. So, uh, we are now developing uh, wearable devices which can be a uh, basic component for uh, con constructing for constructing optimal user interface for various uh, field work. So, so we think a head-mounted display. Uh, this is a kind of a symbol of wearable devices. Uh, is uh, important to uh, to present uh, visual information to the workers in a hands-free fashion. So we have developed one uh, like this. It has uh, cameras, it also has uh, cameras and uh, the voice uh, communication capabilities. But for input devices, uh, we, we think some kind of uh, de devices which minimize uh, users' operations in the field. So um, now we are working on developing uh, input devices which enable more direct interaction with services. Then I will show you uh, two devices from now. Uh, one is the so-called uh, so globe style wearable list devices. Uh, this device is actually uh, designed to uh, enable direct interaction with services by simple physical motion. So uh, as shown in this figure, uh, it has an NFC tag reader and contact direction sensor at fingertip and motion sensors at, uh, at near the list. So uh, by using an NFC tag reader, it is possible to uh, operate with also to enable weapon touch tag reading. That is very uh, useful to trigger uh, services uh, immediately, af with Im immediately after detecting a touch operation. And the uh, user can also use uh, hand gesture input by motion sensors. So this device can be uh, connected with uh, smart devices by a Bluetooth connection. And uh, mobile application on smart devices can handle, uh, can handle uh, tag reading or gesture input event to trigger services on the backend servers. So I would like to show you some demonstration for gesture input. Now uh, he's now assembling some, some devices uh, referencing uh, manuals. So uh, he, can, he can scroll pages by simple gesture. So uh, this is another example. So by using gesture, our devices, it's possible to check, check, check very simply using simple gestures. So okay, and now I will show you some application example uh, that is uh, wiring cable tasks. Okay. Oh. 
Okay. Uh, in, this in this demonstration, uh, workers were, uh, were uh, head mount display, and we used uh, AR technologies. So uh, it is by using AR technology, it is possible to uh, show work instruction through a head mount display to the workers. So by touching the connector of the cable, uh, the system immediately, uh, immediately show a uh, destination socket to plug it in. So uh, by using wearable devices, uh, it is possible to work continuously without, without requiring uh, in documents or many uh, manuals. So, so uh, next I'll show you our link devices. This one is uh, now, uh, now you, you can uh, see the real demonstration in the exhibition booth. So uh, this is a, a compact and lightweight device that can be used in a wide variety of field work. So it, the, the feature of this device is hand lighting input, simple hand light input in the air. So it is possible to use used for text entry by text entry and also can be used to so some, somehow uh, writing down some notes on the images. So, so this is our uh, link devices and it, this is a demo of input numbers by hand, hand written, hand writing. And it, actually it is possible to input some kind of complex Chinese characters also. And it, this feature is also, uh, of course used to select so a menu selection. And this is uh, actually helpful with uh, head mounted displays. And this device also has an uh, NFC tag reader and it is possible to trigger some kind of application immediately. And also, this is a demo of a handwritten memo on the image. So, so far, uh, I have been talking about our wearable technologies. But as you know well, uh, there is another big technology trend that is the Internet of Things. So, uh, over 50 billion things will be connected to network in 2020. And it is estimated that uh, market volume will be reached over one trillion dollars in 2020. So uh, people expect that new services will be created by big data from uh, massively connected things, devices. So now, I will show you one idea to integrate wearable technologies and IoT technologies. So uh, this is, uh, so uh, we think the wear, we think the wearable devices can be, and IoT devices can be dynamically connected around the activities space of human beings. For example, in the hospital, uh, wearable devices and other uh, medical devices and sensors around the patients can be dynamically connected to the smart devices of uh, nurse. So uh, in the home call, uh, it, it may be possible to uh, devices at patient home can be dynamically connected to the nurse. So uh, of course and cloud, will play a big role to connect each this hyper this hyper connected spaces uh, to enable a collaboration so this is just one idea but why i show that this idea is that uh, we think uh, elemental technologies continue to be advanced so rapidly but we have to think about its application. And the application is very 
important to brush them up or to analyze and expand the application area. But the uh, question is, what kind of new application can be created? We have to think about that. So we, I think uh, uh, to explore a new application would open new research topics for future advanced technologies. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sawasaki san. Uh, this is something I think uh, uh, Dr. Sawasaki has been uh, researching, and also some of that is your belief, your vision for the future. So um, let me turn uh, this uh, to uh, Professor Pfister just to see what you have been experiencing and what you have to share with us. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I've been working on wireless sensor networking and, and what turned into the Internet of Things for more than 20 years now, which um, is unfortunate because it means that I'm old. And I used to be young and, I, I, oh well. Uh, so I'm a professor at Berkeley. I started a sensor networking company, Dust Networks, uh, 13 years ago, recently sold to Linear Technology. And I want to say a little bit about what we've done. Uh, there's, there's a lot of hype about Internet of Things right now and precious little actual deployments that work. Uh, we've done a bunch of real deployments and want to show you some of those, and then uh, some of the research that we're doing at Berkeley right now, and then where I think things are going in the future. So I got interested in this uh, when I was first an assistant professor at UCLA back in 1992, and we were asked to look out uh, to 2030 and figure out what the world was going to look like and how uh, wireless and Moore's Law and MEMS sensors were all going to come together. And uh, you know what, what would that change? How, how would that change the way we interact with, with the world? And I thought you know the, the previous talk was just great at, at showing the same kinds of, of things inside of Fujitsu. It's very clear we've got a similar view of, of how this how this is going to work. So in '97, uh, I wrote a proposal called Smart Dust to DARPA, where the goal was to follow all of these uh, Moore's Law kinds of technologies down their exponentials in size, power, and cost, and try and put a wireless sensor node into a one cubic millimeter volume. And uh, we had a four years to do that. At the end of that time, uh, we showed, uh, oops, that's interesting. It does seem a little awkward. We demonstrated this device here. Uh, so this is uh, a, a MEMS chip with some optical communication on it a CMOS chip, which is the brains of the thing, and then a solar cell array. And this has a volume of about five cubic millimeters, and it did, in fact, wirelessly communicate data from its sensors to an optical interrogation system uh, of 50 meters away. In addition to going really small, we also made some off-the-shelf wireless sensor nodes with microprocessor, radio, smallest battery, smallest sensors we could get, created an open source movement in the hardware and then the software Berkeley Motes and TinyOS uh, that really spread across the planet and launched me on uh, an industrial endeavor that uh, caused, it, as it turns out, my, my interest in making small, reliable wireless sensor nodes had application first in industrial process automation. And so now uh, on oil rigs all over the planet, whether you're uh, in the middle of, of the Bakersfield Desert or out in the North Sea, uh, where you're transporting the oil, there's sensors monitoring these things and wirelessly reporting. Uh, the refineries that refine the oil are filled with sensors uh, everywhere, uh, wireless sensors. The uh, uh, rail cars that transport them, the contents of the cars are being monitored, the bearings are being monitored, the, the uh, hatches and whatnot are monitored on these rail cars with wireless sensor networks. Uh, the cars that we, we drive in on, the, uh, on our streets are being monitored by parking sensors in the streets. This is a picture of San Francisco, so if you drive around in the city, you'll see little sensors embedded in the pavement that tell uh, whether the parking space is full or empty uh, or not. Uh, the uh, uh, places where we buy our food, the power is monitored, and the, the temperature of the refrigeration and freezer cases is monitored. Uh, the, uh, our data communication sensors are monitored with wireless sensor networks now. Uh, man, this thing is sensitive. And, and, and so on. So all of these are examples of real deployments of real sensors that I've personally been involved in with the 
uh, wireless heart standard that uh, we created at, at Dust Networks and, and uh, a smart mesh IP standard. So with that, uh, as, as background, you know, the, the real world is an ugly place. This is an example of uh, deployments out of the middle of the Saudi desert where the, it turns out the biggest challenge uh, you know, these, so these are, these are the wireless sensors here. There's the antenna. Uh, there's a, a C cell battery in there that will operate this wireless sensor node as a relay node for packets for its friends uh, for seven years uh, with 99.999% a, a uh, data throughput reliability uh, and security, by the way, which is critical in all of this, uh, whether you're doing it for healthcare, industrial process automation, or just you know, controlling your home HVAC system. That's a, that's a separate topic. I wish I could be in the meeting upstairs as well, uh, since it's critical for both sides. Um, so from the Saudi desert to the North Slope uh, in Alaska, you know, this, there's a sensor buried inside of the uh, ice case, you know, communication range of about a mile out in the middle of the North Sea. So it really works. And those, that's sort of the, the commercialization of the vision that we had for millimeter scale wireless sensor nodes uh, took a very different path once we got out of the university, but that was a direct result. Back in the university now, I've got both a hardware and a software focus. On the hardware side, I want to take uh, a wireless sensor node, which today you can buy the radio and the microprocessor on a single chip, but then you've got a bunch of external components. You've got the sensor, you've got the antenna, you've got the battery, you've got the crystals for the radio and real-time clock. I'd like to get rid of all of those, uh, put crystals on chip using MEMS technology, put the sensors on chip using MEMS technology, put the power supply on chip using solar cells. We've all, the piece, all of these pieces have been demonstrated individually. Uh, so then you end up with a single chip that is truly uh, a self-contained single chip wireless sensor node. It has zero external components. These things start talking to each other in the glow from the plasma etcher that etches the last layer of, of metal uh, that they're fabricated in. So with that, the, the, the dream is then to do body-centric uh, sensing and, and computing. And uh, as an example of where, you know, all the way back in the beginning of the Smart Dust project, uh, we were thinking about this. So in 1999, we made a data glove. Everybody was making data gloves at the time. Ours was a little different in that we did it by putting accelerometers on the fingertips, wired them back to a wireless thing on the wrist, and my students showed that using that, they could, in fact, uh, you know, emulate a mouse so you could drive around on the, on the uh, screen by using the accelerometers. You could sense the acceleration of the fingertips to do the mouse clicks. You could, in fact, type. It was cumbersome, but you could, in fact, detect whether the, the finger was going down on the home row or below and whether it was going sideways or not. And, in fact, you could do rudimentary uh, American Sign Language. We didn't get the, the ones that require motion like J and stuff like that. But we showed that all this was possible. And the reason was that the, the, the dream was not to have the data glove, but to be able to reduce this down to where it can sit on my fingernail and have have a moat on every one of my fingers chronically. So a few of my grad students and I walked around for a week with a, a cubic millimeter of silicon glued to each one of our fingernails just to see whether it would bother us, and it, it, it didn't. So, so that's, that's the dream. All right, where am I supposed to be playing with this? And, uh, the next interim step came fairly recently, and I brought a, a handful of these guys. These are what we call ring gena, so a, a fully wireless uh, three-axis accelerometer, three-axis gyroscope, three-axis magnetometer with microprocessor, radio, crystals, and all the passives that you need now fits on a board this big, and that's, you know, with university level of integration. If you were doing this in a company, you could do much better. And those then fit into these, you know, sort of ugly rings, but they're, they're no worse than the hideous brass rats that uh, my friends from MIT seem to wear with pride. Um, and we've shown that with that, uh, if you wear one of these on each one of your fingers, you can, in fact, do the same kinds of things. You can do corded keyboard input. You can do the, the uh, uh, you know, keypads and, and so on. You've got all the same kinds of capabilities. Um, this is an open source platform. Anybody's welcome to download the designs for it and the software and everything else and use it. So that's a step in, the, in that direction. Uh, and the, the vision, then, is that you know, we, we, we demonstrated that these things were possible back in 99, fairly recently. You know, we, we, on a multi-year uh, effort to reduce them. This is about as small as in a university you're going to get them with off-the-shelf components. And the dream, you know, this is just a, a fake 
picture, but the dream is that someday that chip will have everything on it. It'll have the solar cells, the radio, the microprocessor, the sensor, the crystals, the antenna, the entire thing, and, uh, and be able to serve as this wireless sensor node. And then when you've got that, when you've got your, your keyboard and your mouse with you, and in fact a 3D input device with you wherever you are, you can not only type in the shower, which is where I get all of my good ideas for the day. I spend the rest of the day trying to remember what was it that I was thinking about, uh, that I had my agenda. I guess I should just take a wax pen and write on the door or something like that. But, but if I had my keyboard and I could be typing notes to myself, uh, the, the, the drawing in, in air, sculpting in three dimensions, uh, I like you know, playing air guitar and air drums and all sorts of game kinds of, of things. That's the, the future. Again, with, with heads up displays and, and uh, you know, Google Glass and things, things like that, you know, why would you ever want to take your cell phone out of your pocket? You want that cell phone there because of the global connectivity that it gives you, the incredible horsepower that it gives you in terms of computation and storage and whatnot, but the user interfaces, your fingers don't want to be tapping on, on little things on your keyboard. They want to be doing the natural things, the, the high bandwidth things that we've developed over the last 100 years for user input and, and the display on your, uh, in your glasses. So that's, that's the dream of, of where we'd like to end up uh, with our hyper powers and uh, I, I think, you know, I didn't, get, I didn't talk about the software side at all, but we have uh, an open source effort to do all the high reliability, low power uh, sensor networking stuff that, that uh, is being standardized inside the IETF and the IEEE right now uh, to give to people. I think that's, that standardization is almost done. The open source software is, is uh, pretty much ready for people to play around with. Single chip moats are coming. Energy scavenging is absolutely the, the future, uh, and the, the energy consumption is down to the point where you can effectively assume that these things are gonna last forever. Um, and uh, RF communication is just getting better and better. And believe it or not, I think that ultimately the lowest energy communication for these kinds of body-worn devices is gonna end up being 60 gigahertz. That's where we're gonna end up putting all of our uh, uh, stuff. But that, that's, a, that's another wild academic claim. And then uh, MEMS for radios is absolutely the future, and that uh, sooner rather than later. So, and just finally, just to uh, uh, show, show off Fujitsu in the upper right-hand corner, it's been a, a member of the Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Center uh, before. Uh, I showed you just, just one, or I guess two, of 99 projects that we have ongoing there, and uh, would love to see more interaction with Fujitsu in that forum, and anybody else as well. So, thank you very much. Glad to hear both from Professor Pfister and also Dr. Sasaki-san. There's a common thing there, two or three common things. One that's interesting to me, to, to me is the ring. You both kind of have a talking about ring. So, uh, um, Professor Pfister, you said you are dreaming to put the finger sensor on that, and one day you hope that you can put it on the, the tip of the nail, right? How, 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 how far they are, or how close we are going to <laughs> So I, I would say that um, I, I am one three-year DARPA-funded project away from having mm -hmm. working prototypes of that. I, I think we might get there uh, within three years, even without a big chunk of funding. But for sure, in three years, with some with real funding, we could do it. Is that mainly because uh, resource allocation issues? Is not really the technology science. For example, the silicon or the MEMS technology is not there yet. There's an enormous amount of effort that goes into a system that integrates all those components in it. So just the just the single chip moat itself, even if you if you think of it, assuming it's going to have external components with a crystal and everything else. If you talk to, uh, I'm sure the people in your own organization or people at uh, TI or Freescale or Atmel, who or, or, or my company who do this, you know that's a ballpark. Uh, you know, uh, man decade or, or a couple of man decades worth of effort just to do all the little pieces that go around integrating that microprocessor and radio and all the analog components and everything else that go into it. It's an enormous amount of, of effort that goes into that. When you add into it that you have to invent new technologies in order to do the uh, on-chip MEMS devices for the frequency reference for the radio. So that's, that's really the fundamental hard problem is how do you get a radio that can run on 100 microwatts. Exactly. That's, that's, that's the real challenge. And you, you wanted the battery to be embedded into the chip as well. That yeah, so, so <laughs> are, solar, are you sure you're going to make it happen, or one day someone's going to make it happen? Uh, so we, we actually have several groups at Berkeley, uh, several different faculty who are printing 
uh, e either inkjet printed or screen printed batteries with various chem chemistries. There's silver chemistries, there's lithium chemistries uh, directly onto silicon. So, and there are companies that are doing this, as some, there may be some of you in the audience today. Um, but the, the idea of printing batteries directly on silicon is, is established. So we can do that if we need to. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather do it just from the solar power that I can get from the room. I see. Um, but somehow you can see there in small size, the cell powered somewhere you can put on, the, on top of the nail will be achieved. I, I absolutely believe that that will happen. Okay. If we have changed to to three, three years later, I would like to see that. And <laughs> so um, we got uh, 20 minutes left here, but we, I do want to open uh, the question. I, I, w I think you, oh, you already have that? Okay, so maybe you go first. <coughs> I, uh, question, hello? hello? One, two. Yeah, three. we can hear you. <laughs> the question here is, uh, uh, Professor, do you, do you have a, a vision that uh, one of those days we can get a single chip moat uh, implanted uh, into the body and can resist a football level of uh, impact uh, while uh, doesn't need to open up my body to, uh, uh, to change the battery? <laughs> uh, while, I mean, it's uh, concealed by my skin, so uh, I mean, in, even in-room light would not be able to charge up the solar cell. I would uh, really like to hear about uh, your insight into this kind of uh, thing. So good, uh, it's a good question. You know, how do how do you do energy scavenging if you don't have access to light? Uh, so the the you know if I can glue them on my fingernails, then I get to I get to run in the light. If I want to do chronic implants, then I have to have some other mechanism. Uh, and it, it, it turns out actually within the first you know 100 microns or so of the skin, you get enough light coming through, it's, it's not quite as good as being in, you know, above, but, but you actually can get, especially the infrared where uh, you can be most efficient in terms of scavenging. But there, there are, I have, I have colleagues who are working on and colleagues who have demonstrated scavenging energy from the blood sugar itself. So using your own body, so every time <laughs> you eat a candy bar, you're charging up your, <laughs> your wireless sensors. So they've, uh, my, Michelle Maharbis has done that. Uh, Bernard Bozer is working on that. Um, right now, they've they've got a, actually a, they're getting more than a microwatt per centimeter squared on a, an insect that they're running it on. So it demonstrated it. It fouls after about 12 hours at this point, but that's just the first demonstration. So at some point, that should be possible. Make a fuel cell using your own blood sugar. Well, we're hoping <laughs> that can need to happen very soon as well. Um, well. Oh, Anyone have the other questions? Or, uh, and I, I do have one question for you, Dr. sasaki san If uh, Professor Pister, Pister can make that little sensor happen, mm. and other than the demo you did, using that to write a character on the screen or to check the menu, what else do you think those kind of sensor technology can be used mm. for uh, enterprise customer or even for what do you think that would be a best way to use Chris, the little tiny device? Okay, I'd like to use uh, tiny devices, a lot of tiny devices on her body mm -hmm. to recognize the working context. I, I think the most uh, difficult thing is to uh, detect the human behavior directly. So there are many researchers who put uh, wearable sensors on well, for example, uh, around the ankle, mm -hmm. around the wrist, and to, uh, to analyze the motion. Uh, but uh, it is still difficult to know what kind of motion people are doing with small, num small amount of sensors. But uh, if a if, um, lot of sensors can be put it in without uh, bothering, without bothering uh, people, it is possible to some kind of uh, learning algorithm to uh, classify uh, types of motion uh, somehow uh, correctly. That kind of information is very useful for industrial applications to manage uh, workers' conditions and or, uh, or recognizing the uh, working context, I think. Okay, you have different view? I, I agree completely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, uh, Chris, I have a question for you on, specifically on getting the cost of these down 
so that it's practical, not only to put it, you know, in your every pair of jeans that get sold and shirts and uh. everything, but also for the do-it-yourself market. I'm the founder of Tech Shop, so obviously I, I'm all about do-it-yourself. And right now I can get an Arduino, uh, you know, either a bare chip or a, a tiny board along with like, a, like an RF24 transceiver. I can buy those on eBay and get the cost down to like $3 for the pair mm -hmm. of those and actually add a little sensor of some sort and make a wireless network. And I'm actually playing with that lately in my house and a battery, then, and that's pretty much all you need. So that's already like 4 or $5 for a do-it-yourself. Can you get these down to, you know, 25 cents, 50 cents, something like that? Okay, or, or even less. And I think it needs to be down in those costs before we can really see the Internet of Things happen. What, what's your thought on that? Well, I guess I, I would agree with you and disagree with you. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, I think the, inter the Internet of Things is going to happen quite well uh, even if the individual nodes are 10 or 20 or $30. There's just so much value there. Maybe not in the home market, but, but you know, in like HVAC monitoring in a complex like this or something like that, the, the cost of the sensors is not the limiting factor, at, even in the tens of dollars. It still makes uh, economic sense. But at the same time, absolutely want to bring the cost down. That's been the, the, the dream from day one. And that is one of the things, in addition to the convenience of having a single chip mode and the, and the uh, you know, ease of use for body-centric mm. applications of having something that you can do, it's obviously the cheapest way of doing it as well. Mm. You know, those, those chips, if you look at, at the, the, the manufacturing cost of, of silicon, a, a big fraction of that is involved in the packaging. And if you look at the manufacturing cost of the final end product, with all of the sensors on there and all of you know all power and, and everything else, the, the it, it's it's orders probably two orders of magnitude higher than the than the cost of the bare dice, right? And silicon costs something like you know, CMOS costs something like five cents a square millimeter. I mean that's you, you buy TSMC wafers and you know maybe it's a little more, maybe it's a little less depending upon what you get. These chips are going to be a few maybe maybe five square millimeters at five cents a square millimeter. You're going to make profit, so you decide what your margin is. But those numbers work out very nicely to, to hit the kinds of numbers you're talking about. And if you look at RFID tags, for example, the cost is not yeah. in the chip, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's an extreme example. It's all about, you know, how do I make the absolute cheapest printed mm -hmm. foil film package thing that I can stick this mm -hmm. chip in? The chip is practically free. That's where we want to get to and, and get, get rid of the packaging completely. Okay, so we have hope there. One day, we'll, oh, yes, the, the one behind there, I'm sorry. Oh, you want to go first? Oh. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, professor, um, this might be a bit of a basic and a little bit silly question, but for uh, w once you get these sensors down to finger, you know, something that you might be able to finger wear on your fingernails, mm -hmm. your fingernails grow, right? So you might be having to repl like move them or something on like maybe like a weekly interval or something like that. And I, it, it appeared to me from like a usability uh, mm -hmm. perspective to have to remove and reattach these tiny little devices on your fingertip, that seems really cumbersome and would be a non-trivial factor in actually using these devices. But you figure seven billion people, 10 fingers per person, <laughs> new set every six months. This is a market, man. This is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think if you just look, I mean, there are plenty of people on this planet happily apply mm. false fingernails once every how often they need to, right? It's, it's something that people do. If it, if it really gives you the capabilities that I think it will give you, it's something you'll, you'll just do it because, well, you know, it's once a month or once every however long as they grow out, you'll, you'll and probably you'll dissolve the glue and re-glue them on further back. But I, I think people will, will get used to it if it's as useful as, as I think it will be. So you can open a nail shop doing the digital <laughs> thing. I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so it's... 2023, the little single chip is well sub dollar. What are your top ways in which a healthy person's life is really different? A uh, healthy person's life, yeah. So I, and I, I do think that, that you know, enabling the disabled is one of the tremendous uh, Yeah, that's why I said that. Potentials. Mm -hmm. So in a healthy person, it's, it's probably going to be, you know, 
15-year-old gaming or social networking or something like that that, it, that, that mm -hmm. changes in ways that I can't even imagine. Uh, Neil Stevenson's book, The Diamond Age, uh, sort of is, is a good place to look for that. I mean, that, look to science fiction, I guess, for, for the ways that it impacts mm -hmm. people beyond kind of the, the, the very impactful mm -hmm. but, but sort of obvious ways that, mm -hmm. that you, know, you and I might, might think about it. If you've got good ideas, let us, well, let us know. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to hear your favorite because I ask this question a lot. <laughs> So I was, I'm, I'm old, I, I bleached my beard with peroxide, and, um, but in the, in the 70s, uh, we had mailing lists, those of us who were on the ARPANET then, and we could have told you 10 ways the internet was going to change your life. We didn't know um, that it would be Facebook particularly, or we'd all be billionaires, but we knew a lot of things you were going to do, and we could paint a lot of pictures, and people in IoT have a much harder time answering the question, so I always like to hear their answers, that's all. So, and you can, you can read, uh, you know, I, I wrote something in the year 2000 called Life in 2010 and, and got it completely wrong. <laughs> you, you but, see, all of my predictions that I remember were correct. <laughs> we need your help then. But, you know, one of the, the, the one that I thought, well, 2010 sounds too early, so I put it out to 2020. It was the only thing I put longer was the, the networked body where the, the chronic sensor implants that you have inside of you that are continuously monitoring your health and, mm -hmm. and, and letting you know ahead of time whether mm -hmm. you're getting sick. I thought that was gonna be longer in the future. And, mm -hmm. and it still is largely, but at the same time, one of our BSAC member companies makes implantable mm -hmm. medical devices. And mm -hmm. in 2009, and these things have you know, wireless communication to go to some doctor's instrument or mm -hmm. sometimes something beside the bed. In 2009, they approached me and said, you know, some of our customers have several of our devices in them you know, there's the pacemaker and the this and the this, mm. and we're thinking maybe they should network together instead of all talking mm. to that device. So we're actually, we're getting there. And I, mm. I do think even in a healthy person, the, the, the chronic sensor network that's, you know, looking at your blood chemistry and looking mm. at your lymph chemistry and looking at just all that stuff, mm. you never have an unanticipated illness. You know, you still may get something that kills you, but at least it doesn't, it's not one of these things where it sneaks up on you and it's too late before Unless you Unless your out. mother didn't vaccinate you. Unless your mother didn't vaccinate you, and then you... Uh, okay, thank you for, for the question. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, we have a few minutes for you. Yeah, let's take another one. Uh, yeah. Thank you for giving me a second chance. Sure. <laughs> Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, this is uh, for Dr. Sawasaki. Uh, the question here is, uh, from the uh, industry point of view, uh, do you see software will be the limiting factor for pushing the human-centric computing or the hardware? Which one? And uh, given that you are a, a, such a high rank uh, official in a company, uh, mm -hmm. how do you develop your next generation uh, engineering staff? I mean, what kind of people will you recruit mm -hmm. from the university? Because uh, I mean, otherwise um, you won't get uh, the right kind of people to work on the right kind of technology, right? Okay. So, uh, what kind of people we, or, 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 or talent? Well, or first, first of all, is that, do you mm. see software as a limitation, limiting yeah. factor? Right. Mm. I mean, if you have uh, more software staff, mm. then uh, hardware or more staff. Hardware or, or, or architect or, 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 or communication. Second part, yeah. second part is uh, what kind of skill set will you try mm. to recruit from you the will, university? Yeah, yeah, you will need it for this uh, strategy. Okay. Software, uh, hardware, so, so, uh, uh, network, radio. Okay. Uh, I think that the hard, uh, I think it's a, uh, so uh, technology um, like semiconductor technologies uh, will be advanced and so uh, we need not care, actually I need not care about uh, hardware, 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 but, uh, but uh, I'm worrying about how we can program so many things connected, must we think about that? So we uh, now are developing uh, some, some kind of uh, software platform based on the uh, web protocol uh, over the things. So uh, we have to develop some kind of software platform to easily uh, develop uh, application of uh, many connected things. So you favor the generic hardware with uh, very uh, flexible software to be reprogrammable. Yeah. Do you agree, Chris? I, I, I do think that broadly that's the right answer. Right? Yeah. And, okay. And, 
Uh, thank you very much for asking the question. That's the one other question I was about to ask as well. Uh, we got five minutes left here, so I could use my privilege to ask my question right now. I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've been working in the United States for mm. um, like kind of well, 12 or, or 18 months there. I got a common question or some, when I talk with customers, which is mm. all the sensors you presented or the wearable device or head mm. mount or even rest of it's called very funny. So the, the big question is in our enterprise con or, uh, business operation for or the manufacturing line, where is the kind of sweet spot which really can fit into this sensor or mm -hmm. wearable device which can create a lot more productivity than they mm -hmm. have today? Both of you have some idea of South Korea. Mm -hmm. Where in the enterprise environment can this sensor or wearable technology mm -hmm. bring the most advantage or benefit to the business owner? Uh, so, we can mm -hmm. so uh, it will be the field maintenance. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, there still be uh, so some so some kind of uh, maintenance uh, application will be necessary because mm -hmm. uh, we have many old infrastructure which must be maintained mm -hmm. for, because you know, uh, uh, big earthquakes will happen in mm -hmm. the near future. Mm -hmm. It is expected, it is estimated around Japan. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in Japan, a government say, uh, uh, many of the infrastructure must be checked uh, oh. periodically, but uh, we don't have uh, enough workers to realize that. So uh, I think uh, the wearable devices or sensor system must be used for uh, uh, such kind of maintenance uh, uh, applications. That is, uh, I think uh, that is urgent. That, that's okay. what you believe the area which we can bring immediate benefit to the business yes. owners. Chris, you have different opinion on that? So I agree on, on infrastructure, I think, uh, you know, it, industrial process automation mm. uh, is there's such an immediate ROI for wireless sensors there that it is really taking off faster than anybody anticipated in that glacially slow industry. Mm. It's mm -hmm. still by by you know Silicon Valley startup standards, it's still slow, but it mm. is it's absolutely taking off. Mm. Uh, I think that the next big one is going to be uh, building automation, um, H building HVAC amazing. monitoring, lighting oh, control, know. access control, security, oh. fire. Mm. That, that whole, I mean, the, the number of sensors per square meter is you know, sort mm -hmm. of roughly one per square meter in a building like this. It's Let me ask you a direct question. So when you say all the things, building control, all the sensor, which we already have, some of them, we already have that. So do you think, as far today, we have already implemented all those sensor technology more than we could do or less than we could have much done? Much less, much less than, than could be done. I and mean, the, the problem is that e even with the number that there are today, mm -hmm. There's, Why there's, we still, not? there's still not enough. So if you look mm -hmm. at, at HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh -huh. control, uh, mm -hmm. if you sit in uh, an, an office somewhere with a bunch of offices next to you, the odds are there's somebody who has the, the thermostat that they may not even be able to control, yeah. but it's not in your mm -hmm. office, and yeah. you don't get to control it. Oh, that's there, there, there are mm -hmm. several examples of companies that have gone in with wireless sensors. Mm -hmm. They put a sensor in every office. They, they, they don't change the control infrastructure. The hardware stays the same. Mm -hmm. The algorithms are changed with the new sensor data, and they find that they both increase occupant comfort and decrease energy costs. And the, the energy cost reduction is substantial. It's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's real money. And so why, why we are not doing what we could have done is because uh, awareness or as motivation or as a financial or technology reason where will be bought back? I think on the, on the wired side, wired sensors are just incredibly expensive, and so people haven't done it with wires. Mm -hmm. On the wireless side, the, the fact of the matter is people have tried this you know, every decade or so, and the technology has just not been up to the task. And, and over and over and over when we talked to companies, there was always somebody, some old guy with, with uh, bleached hair, uh, <laughs> would say, you know, yeah, Bob tried wireless uh, back in the 90s. Uh, he doesn't work here anymore. 
<laughs> and so we had, we had a lot of trouble convincing people, this time it really works. And that's okay. you know, using mesh networking technology, okay. throwing every kind of diversity you can at the problem. You can, in fact, hit the kind of reliability that people need to do what they want. So I, I do think it's going to happen now. Yeah. But there's so many singed fingers out there. People are so mm. distrustful of wireless. Uh, mm. It's just it's going to take a cultural change. Great. And that really makes me a good news, a bad news. Good news is that there is a huge uh, opportunity because we're not doing as much we suppose we could have done. That would be business opportunity. The bad news to me is that it sounds like the, the excuse of, oh, that old guy's gone, may still inf <laughs> in impact the implementation, but I don't want to get me. But anyway, uh, we are zero right there. So I, I thank you, uh, everyone, to attend this. And thank you, uh, Professor Pixar and Dr. Saskit for us today. Thank you very much.